Hi guys, it's Mr. Y, and today we're going to be talking about the flow of energy. So your learning objectives for today to learn and to know what is the initial source of energy for almost all food chains in the world, uh, know what a food chain shows, what food webs show, know the labels for each level of a food chain or slash food web, and to recognize how pyramids can show levels of energy, mass, or numbers, it should be numbers, of consumers. All right, so by and large, the sun has the most influence on all life on Earth through a single object. Um, you can argue that water has a bigger influence, but water is not a single object by itself. It's thousands and thousands of small water molecules. But the sun, by itself as a single entity, provides the starting point for almost all the energy that life on Earth eventually uses. Um, nearly every food chain you can think of has a starting point with the sun. Now, that doesn't mean all of them do. There are exceptions to this case, and usually we're talking about things that live either in really dark, deep caves or at the bottom of the ocean that have no access to sunlight. Those food chains usually use geothermal energy. But outside of those, most of the food chains, food webs, and things like that um, have their starting point with the energy from the sun. So let's talk about food chains. Most of this should be a review from your seventh grade uh, life science class. A food chain shows a single path of energy flowing through an ecosystem. And <clears throat> you can see here in this nice simple example, you have two different food chains, one on land and one in the ocean. And this first level, the primary producer level, these are the ones that actually start the food chain in terms of life. Now, on the plant side, this guy does photosynthesis. Over here, these guys also will do photosynthesis in most cases. Sometimes they do use geothermal energy, though, in other cases. And these guys are the primary, primary means first, producers, primary producers. And after your producers comes your consumers. And because consumers are creatures that eat other organisms, <clears throat> the f next level is the primary consumer. So here they show a grasshopper eating on the flower. And then the level after that is still a consumer, but now it's a secondary consumer. And then you have a tertiary, is how you pronounce this word, tertiary consumer, that's a third level consumer. And then a quaternary, fourth level consumer. So the order gets kind of confused if you use the real scientific words, but you always start with your primary producers followed by primary consumers then to your secondary consumers, and then your tertiary consumers, and your quaternary consumers. So the producers slash autotrophs, they make their own food. As I said, they're the ones who do photosynthesis usually. Whereas the consumers, these are also called heterotrophs, they must eat other organisms in order to survive. So each of these is a consumer eating the consumer below it. So I like this picture of a food chain because it properly shows that the first energy source for the food chain is the sun. Many food chains will ignore that fact. They'll just start straight at the producers without acknowledging that without the sun, the producer level doesn't exist. And then, of course, you have the primary consumers, also called herbivores because they eat plants, followed by the secondary consumers, which are usually um, omnivores, meaning they eat anything they can get a hold of, plants or animals, and then you work your way up towards the carnivores, the tertiary consumers and the quaternary consumers. And I also like this uh, picture because it also shows an additional stage that wasn't in the last picture. It shows decomposers as part of this. And keep in mind, decomposers, while we tend to put them at the end, you could also argue that they're also at the beginning since they also will break down producers and producers will use the material that decomposers create to to um, grow themselves, the nutrients in the soil. And this arrow at the bottom here at the very bottom shows energy flowing in this direction from the sun all the way up through the different levels. <clears throat> now, food webs. Food webs are slightly different than food chains where I have a picture of a food chain on the left, again, because it's a chain, it's just a straight one, two, three, A, B, C sequence going up, whereas a food web is a lot more complex. It's basically several food chains 
put together. So you have one food chain here, another food chain here, another food chain here, and then it just gets growing and growing on itself. So food webs are much more accurate ways of seeing interactions between organisms to see where an organism's niche is in its ecosystem. Uh, keep in mind both models show how energy flows from the bottom up to the top as well. So here's a simplified example of a food web. Uh, this is an aquatic food web and notice it does in fact have a few multiple paths. There's at least two or three multiple paths, but this is a very, very simplified version. Here is a much more realistic version of a, a slightly more complex food web. Again, you have arrows pointing at who's eating who. Well, actually, this is showing, I'm sorry, it's pointing at who is doing the eating and who is getting eaten. So the phytoplankton here is eaten by these guys here and here, and these guys will also be eaten by the krill and these can be eaten by carnivorous plankton and carnivorous plankton can be eaten by birds and birds can be eaten by small tooth whales and then so on and so forth. So the arrows are actually showing you who's doing the eating in this case. It's not always that obvious. Um, sometimes you have to sit there and wonder which way the arrows are pointing and what are they telling you. They won't make a, a obvious distinction but usually this is showing the way the energy is flowing through the food web. Same case here, this is a land food web, and again, the arrows are showing the way in which the energy flows, and you can see, especially going from the primary to the secondary consumer, it gets really complex really quick. So these primary consumers, the herbivores, um, excuse me, uh, are eaten by lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of other things. The secondary consumers, which can be herbivores, or sorry, which can be omnivores and carnivores, and by the time you get to the tertiary consumers, you're dealing with only the carnivores, the ones that eat meat exclusively. Okay, now let's move on to other types of diagrams. For the next part, we're going to be talking about nothing but pyramids, and more pyramids, and more pyramids. So the first type of pyramid diagram we have to talk about is called an energy pyramid. This shows the total amount of, surprise, energy at each level. Now, the levels themselves are called trophic levels. So a single trophic level would be this. That's a single trophic level, and there's a trophic level above it and another trophic level below it. And of course, they have the same basic labels as a food chain. So you have your primary producers at the bottom, followed by your primary consumers, followed by your secondary consumers, followed by your tertiary consumers way on top. Sometimes there'll be an extra level, a quaternary level consumer, but not always. And what the energy pyramid shows is if you look at this number down here in the bottom left, and here, these are measures of kilocalories. Now, uh, kilocalories is a measure of actually heat, and a kilocalorie is a thousand small calories. But what you'll notice is the numbers themselves, they start off at 9,000, and then they drop to 900, they drop to 90, and they drop to 9 by the time you hit the tertiary consumer. So only about 10% of the energy from any one level goes to the next level above it. So of that 9,000 kilocalories we first started with, only 900 calories actually made it up uh, to the next level above it, and that's per square meter per year. Um, the other 90% is usually used by the body uh, of the organism that's at that level for its metabolism, by the trees for it, their metabolism, um, or by the organisms up here to keep themselves warm, and it keeps getting used for metabolism purposes, usually. Um, sometimes the book will like to say it's loss as heat. I don't like that explanation really at all. Don't ever say that. It's not really lost as heat. It's usually used for metabolism. And here's another example. Um, again, this one I like a little bit better because it shows sunlight as our starting point, just like with the food chains. So you should remember that sunlight always starts these things, even in um, energy pyramids and food chains. Sunlight's always the starting point when we're talking about energy. And so for every million joules of sunlight, you can get about 10,000 joules of primary producers. These are your photosynthesizers 
which gives you about a thousand joules for the same area of primary consumers, which gives you about a hundred joules for your secondary consumers, your omnivores, your herb, your omnivores or your herbivores, and only about ten joules for your top carnivores, your tertiary consumers, or even your. If you had a quaternary consumer, it would only get one joule, because again, you only get about ten percent one joule. If we were to go one level higher higher excuse me uh, a joule is a unit of energy you don't have to worry about that for right now but just know it's a measure of energy it's just like kilocalories is a measure of energy another type of pyramid diagram is called a biomass pyramid this shows the amount of mass biomass mass it shows the amount of matter that gets transferred to each trophic level from the level below it and again because it's a pyramid it becomes less and less and less each level up. So on this bottom left hand side you have 500 kilograms, that's a mass, of plants. That is enough for 500 kilograms of mice or rats to survive, which is just enough to support a 50 kilogram snake, which is just enough to support a 5 kilogram hawk. And uh, it should be 50 kilograms of snakes. That's more than one snake. That's a really large snake if it's only 50 kilograms by itself. All right, <clears throat> on the left, oh, I'm sorry, the right top right side, you can see a very similar picture. Again, they start at 1,000 over here, then it drops to 100 kilograms, then 10, then 1 by the time you get to the top carnivores. Again, your book implies that usually this is only 10% going from one level to the next. It's not always that, that honest uh, in real life. Real life has lots of little exceptions. So, it's not so much a stable percentage in this food uh, pyramid, which is a real food pyramid. Um, it actually shows the varying amounts of percentages percentages that go up each level. You can see the first level only got 4% of the level befo below it. The next level got 30%, which is definitely way above 10%. The next level got 14%. So 10% is more like... A general average. It's not a hard, fast law or anything like that, but it's a good uh, point of reference. Usually it's a good average to, to make a guess on. Keep in mind that some food pyramids um, actually don't even work in the pyramid form. This one here actually is more like an hourglass. It actually goes in and then comes back out. This is a very rare case though, but it does occasionally happen. So this is a food pyramid that's actually somewhat reversed in its stature. And then lastly we have pyramid diagrams that are called pyramids of numbers. Now this is just showing the total number of creatures in a particular area. So it's one area and the total number of creatures. Not how much they weigh and not the energy, just how many of each creature. So for this given area they're showing a grassland in summertime this particular area that they're measuring can support 1,500,000 producers, which could then support 200,000 herbivores, which would be enough to support 90,000 primary carnivores, which is just enough to support one top-level carnivore. And again, this is a pyramid system, so you get less and less as you go up. And you'll have noticed by this point that the carnivores always seem to be less in number and less in... Um, the amount of energy they get. So to be a top carnivore in real life means you have to have usually very large territories because you have to have enough space to get enough energy and enough uh, mass to support yourself. So that's why there's usually a lot more things like plants than there are animals. And there's a usually a lot more small animals like mice, rodents, things of this nature than there are large mammals like um, lions, tigers, uh, wolves, things like that because of the way the biomass and the energy pyramids work. So one other interesting aspect of, uh, of uh, pyramid diagrams is that they can actually be used to argue about the way people eat and um, this is a fairly common argument in science that if you actually cut out all beef or all meats from your diet, it would actually be more sustainable to the earth. And the idea is that if you look at the pyramid on the right, 
This is if, of course, you eat beef because you would be the one eating the cows and, of course, the cows eat some kind of vegetation or if you eat uh, pigs or goats or anything like that, it works the same way. Whereas if you're a vegetarian, you, of course, are not eating meat and you could therefore support more people if they were vegetarian. So worldwide agriculture could actually feed more people if they were more uh, if they had more vegetarian diets whereas if they're meat eaters well to produce the meat the cows or whatever animal you're talking about had to eat the vegetables first so like I said it's it's kind of an interesting argument it does hold some logic to the way the energy pyramids work that if everybody worked on a was on a vegetarian diet we would actually be able to feed more people on earth Okay, guys, so that's going to wrap up our uh, flow of energy lecture. Make sure you ask questions if you have any in class, and I'll see you in the next video.